Thanks, Tom, and thanks everybody for coming. It's very good of you. I understand a lot of you are in thesis, so um, I understand the time pressure. Um, I should explain, I'm, I'm not quite used to doing lectures about our work, so this has been a little intimidating. Um, and of course the first question will be, does that, yes, that does move the button. So, um, and unfortunately I have to correct Tom, I actually left the government architect a year ago, or I left government a year ago, um, having made the decision that it sort of had to be one or the other. So I just thought I'd give you a quick overview of um, what I call my private life. Um, I've worked for a number of design practices in Melbourne and for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. We hate to really confess how many years. And uh, moved to Ireland for a while and worked over there and have worked overseas before in London and Edinburgh. And then moved to Australia again and set up a practice in uh, Barwon Heads, where I had a house, um, which has since expanded into a studio in Point Lonsdale. We work mainly on residential work. Um, we use very traditional sort of methods of making architecture. So we do use models for testing. We often sketch by hand, conceptually certainly. We, we do a lot of our drawing work by hand and then, and then we bring it into AutoCAD. But you don't see a lot of 3D animation. We, don't, we use SketchUp sort of at a very basic level, um, but we're still very much a, a hands sort of type practice and um, I guess using um, a statement that Troppo made in their gold medal lecture, it was the idea of um, from head to hand to heart, I think, or head, heart to hand. So we, we quite like that sort of sense of value. Um, so in 2009, uh, I saw a job advertised in the Government Architect's Office and um, thought that that could be quite a good thing to do and to actually learn from that and learn from that I did. So I just thought I'd talk about public life and, and what the Government Architect does. I'm not sure if many of you know of the Office of the Victorian Government Architect. I'm looking for some acknowledgement, but so far none. Um, the Office of the Victorian Government Architect does not work like a practice. It is a, a small unit of currently, I think, about six people that sits within the Department of Premier and Cabinet. And, and what they, um, what we were titled as, or what they're titled as, is the champions for the quality of design in the built environment in the state of Victoria. There are government architects in pretty much every state. I'm just trying to think. I think Tasmania currently doesn't have one. There isn't a national government architect, which we certainly have been advocating for, both through the Institute of Architects and through the Government Architects Network, or the state ones. Um, so the role is not so much practice. The role is about advising, particularly in our case, the Victorian government about good design and the built environment and good urban design and what the benefits are to the state. Um, so you can see there it provides leadership and strategic advice. So a lot of our um, work is working primarily with government, not so much with architects, though we do do work with our architects. So the government architect works in sort of two primary sort of duties. One is advocacy, and that's the idea of advocating for good design. What is good design? What are the benefits of good design? And, and how can um, they improve our lives across the state? So two documents that I was involved with, well, there are probably more, but two major ones, um, was good design and transport. And particularly that one, that was my role, to come in and to advise transport projects as to how they could get good design. And I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. And the other paper we worked on was Government a Smart Client. And that, it's a very dry document. <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend going out and reading it. But it was a really important document for us to do to explain to government departments that design doesn't necessarily cost. Good design is something that you implement early and you integrate into your, your work as you're producing the, the projects. And so that was a really important document to get across to them. And it also talked to um, various different major contracts that uh, the government uses, such as what they call public-private partnership and alliances. So they do it in a very competitive market. How do they do it so that they can benefit design? That was the thing that we were trying to sort of get across to them, that they still could get design as a measure in there and get better outcomes rather than it just being about cost and time. Um, and so we would use diagrams like this, for instance, um, explaining that what does good quality of urban design mean? It means that you're creating a place that's sustainable, that's livable and productive. Um, and that it also means that out of that you get living affordability, you're demonstrating leadership and design excellence, inclusive communities. 
um, and then of course environmental responsibility. So a whole lot of things that sort of get captured in there to demonstrate that design isn't just what it looks like, but it's actually how it works and how it can perform. And particularly for the state, what are the benefits out of that? And then the other sort of main duty um, that I had was really advisory. So, and I would say that was probably about 60% of my time. Um, and it was a very privileged position, I have to say, because here I was working in a small little practice down on the southwest coast and I would come into government and talk to these major, very clever architects such as Hassel and Woodmarsh. And so what my role was, was to come in and work particularly with the government agencies and try and encourage them to implement good design. Now, uh, that might sound straightforward. Most rail projects and transport projects are led by engineers. And if not an engineer, then a builder. So the idea of design to them or architecture is flowery and fancy, flouncy and we'll add that later. Don't you worry, we'll, we'll add that bit later. So you can imagine me sitting there going, no, 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 it has to be integrated. We have to integrate good design. It's all those steps you make along the way. It's not just about layering it. And believe me, <laughs> there's still a lot of them that are layering it on. Um, so it would be things like I would go in and advise them about how should, when they put out an expression of interest to get a design team in, write a paragraph about good design, write about why the state values it. Um, when we came to select design, select sort of big consortia for things, I'd be sitting there assessing the design teams and saying whether or not I thought they were a reasonable team, did they have the right people at the table. If they had design ideas, whether or not we thought their design ideas could work and they could be implemented. And then through the process, I would constantly be reviewing the sort of urban design and the landscape and the architecture work and trying to get the engineers to understand that there are very simple things that can be done that will make for a better outcome. So if I gave you an example, for instance, there was one incident where everybody had this, and I thought this was hilarious, in a big step way, um, they wanted to move the train station. So we had the ideally sort of positioned idea of the train station being near a community facility so that people could get on off the train and they're straight into the community facility. Ideally where we always have them is in mixed activity areas. They had this great idea that they were going to move the train station about another 100 metres away because during construction the train could go at 60 k's instead of 40 k's. And everybody thought this was a fabulous idea. And then I sat there and I said, so do you mean to tell me that for two years the train will go 20 k faster, but for the 100 years that that train station will stay there, it will always go at 100 k. And they went, yes. So we're going to move it 100 metres so that we can have it in a position that we don't really want to have it so that for two years, out of 102 years, it can go 20 k faster. And then the rest of the team sat there and went, oh no, we don't want that. No, no, that's right. So they're just, there's small little things like that that um, can make a big impact. And um, so, and honestly, that's a win. <laughs> With engineers, that is a win in there. So, um, and so also about encouraging things. So things like the lights, for instance, on the Maribyrnong Bridge at, on the Regional Rail Link project, they were, they were a bit of a battle. Everybody was very hesitant. Train drivers were saying there was going to be too much light, etc. It was ameliorated and now, of course, it's become quite an iconic element in, in the Footscray area. So the privilege of it was sometimes also, it wasn't just about train stations, sometimes it was about a bus stop and where is a bus stop located and what's the transparency and, um, and how does it work in terms of its connection. Or the other was working on quite substantial projects like the Melbourne Metropolitan Rail project that's coming through. So, you know, very big, much, very much city shaping projects. So we'd be looking at where are they coming along, where is it landing, where are the stops coming out and then what's the quality of the design around it. And often in projects like that too, we would be brokering relationships with the local stakeholders. So particularly in Parkville, um, there were regular meetings that I had with the university and um, the hospital and some other major player um, about how it was going to come in and how it was going to be um, introduced into the space and what was the best outcome for the area. So obviously they're still working through that. And then also providing design advice like things to, to things like the Flinders Street design, design Competition. So the government architect was sitting on various parts of the project and I was involved in how are we going to get the best outcome in terms of procurement. If, it, if we want to deliver this project, how is it potentially going to be delivered? And then also helping inform the transport brief. And I think the really important thing about the transport brief there is it's not me commenting about engineering or how trains run. 
what it was was about me reminding them that there are people and people moving. So it was really looking at the place and how the place impacts on people. Um, the quality of movement, the quality of safety, light, etc. like that. So it, it isn't so much that we get involved in, in the engineering and understanding how trains work, etc. But it's more about what is the architecture and what is the built environment having an impact on in terms of people. Um, so, and glibly the other day in a chapter council meeting there was a line thrown away saying, well, good design is subjective, there is no measure. Now, I had to contradict that and say, no, actually we can measure good design because certainly as the um, arbiters and the champions for, for good design in the Government Architects Office, we obviously had to demonstrate how we did it. So there are various documents that do that. Now, Victoria has more or less signed up to, it's not enforced, but Victoria in principle signed up to something called the Urban Design Charter for Victoria. And if you see that list, hopefully you can see them. <laughs> um, if you see that list, they're fairly sort of straightforward points. They're not anything sort of esoteric or sort of grand. They're really simple principles about um, legibility, intuitive way of finding, so people can actually find themselves through a space. Um, safety, passive surveillance, light spaces, etc., like that. Certainly moments of joy um, and animation, functional, um, the idea of mixed use. So quite straightforward sort of principles that we would then use to measure. And when I say measure, it was never a tick the box. It was always, or a score. We, f we find that a very difficult thing to do. It's more about a sort of verbal dialogue and a written dialogue about why is this, this quite positive outcome or why is it not so much of a positive outcome. Um, uh, and the one that um, came out not long after I started there was Creating Places for People, which I think is a really great title because it reminds everybody that that's what good design, urban design, good architecture and landscape architecture can be about. It's about people. So this is the urban design protocol for Australian cities. So I thought for tonight, and this is a very strange way of going about it, I thought that I'd sort of more or less base the talk on what we do on the basis of of the creating places for people principles, just the three high level ones. So you can see there again a set of very clear principles that are very easy, simple things to understand. Um, and as I said, it's not that we sit there and go through them necessarily, but we might set them up as a framework as the principles for a project that then get developed a bit more in detail. And we certainly encourage project teams to use these as the foundation. So if they were establishing their sort of ideas of how they were going to measure criteria, then we would say, well, why don't you go to the urban design protocol and develop those in more detail for this project. So on that basis, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the work that I've been doing and the team's been doing in light of places, people, leadership and governance. Um, and um, so I'm going to take you through five projects. It is going to seem a bit random because of the way we're doing it, but um, let's see how we go. So in terms of place, this is uh, Victoria. I deliberately chose a map that talked about the landscape um, and the terrain rather than um, anybody's territorial rights or roads or anything like that. So as you can see, these are the various projects we've worked on on the sort of various areas. So we've managed to cover quite a lot um, of space in the sort of last um, six to ten years. Um, from up in the mountains, up at Swifts Creek in Omeo, um, across into the Grampians, over to Portland, um, obviously around areas such as Macedon and Bacchus Marsh, um, quite a few projects in South West and on the Bellarine near where we are, and in Melbourne as well where we also have a basin. We've recently started a project in Sydney. Um, so in terms of place, they're quite diverse um, and, um, and it is a fabulous thing about Victoria is it has just an extraordinary, um, extraordinarily diverse landscape and, and unique places within it. So we're in that awfully um, privileged position of, of travelling around Victoria and seeing these fantastic landscapes and experiencing them. Sometimes, albeit as per that centre bottom one, just by the road, that's about as much as we see because we're in a rush. Um, but it certainly gets us across from various areas such as our local coastline and those cows by the way are the ones we see as we go into work and if the Galloway girls aren't there then we all sort of ponder what's going on. Um, so the first project to talk about place is uh, one that's an inner, Mer inner Melbourne um, house. Um, the client came to us um, with an existing dwelling. Um, and as you can see here, it's very much bound by 
um, a lot of other sites that almost makes it an island. So on the left hand side there on the sort of south side is the CityLink um, flyover with the zipper behind. So there's very much a freeway sort of happening behind them there. And then in, on the north northeast side is the park and the zoo area. And to the south uh, is the, the rail line. So they're, they're almost a bit of an island between North Melbourne and, and Brunswick. Um, but obviously with a fantastic connection to the parkland across the way. And this was the house. Um, and this project, in terms of place, very much became about the house, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, so it was 1940s constructed. It was constructed when the banks required that you um, could only get a loan based on so many rooms. So it only has officially two bedrooms. Um, very much the, the spending of a bit of extra money on the front with the Art Deco sort of details and the curved walls to the stairs and the yellow brick. And then we get to the back and it's very much the austere red brick, um, steel framed windows, all very robust. And internally this was the state of it. So, and that probably doesn't tell you a great deal. Um, it had moved. There was a fall from one side of the house to the other of 60 millimetres. Um, it's only on a 300 metre site. Um, so it was quite a lot across um, one room. Um, and um, it was, as you can probably tell from these photos, very internalised, they're not made up. That apart from the, the sort of front bay window, the house had a very internalised sort of sense of place. So um, the idea, and that's the bottom plan there, um, is the existing plan. So the idea was to look at um, what can we do to extend this house and make it a more um, habitable house that connected with the garden. But also um, the big thing was that we had a huge amount of repairs to do. So we ended up calling it the love job, and it was called the swelligant love job, um, because it had some extraordinary swelligant details inside. And so it was really because of the price of having to underpin, re-roof, re-plaster, re-wire, re, re, re everything, um, and then open up some spaces, it was decided that there would be no extension, though there is a stage two to happen. So stage one very much became about what can we do with what's there in terms of its place and its identity. So we chopped off that rear section that you can see, which is the, it was some sort of strange lean-to and a bit of a laundry and bathroom and then opened up the, the kitchen, which was a very austere sort of pokey sort of kitchen, up into the dining space. And then that created a much better flow through where the kitchen, dining, um, sorry, kitchen and living, kitchen and dining were open to each other, but then the dining and living space were open to each other. And then upstairs, again, quite blocked off at the back there. And you'll see that back room there, that was the room that was apparently a veranda. So this goes to that idea of when you got bank loans back then they could only show two bedrooms. So they called it a veranda on the plan. They finished it like a veranda um, but that was actually somebody's bedroom. So in opening the bottom section of the house up to the garden it meant that we were losing the laundry space. So we ended up taking that upstairs in and reconfiguring the bathroom to a very small sort of family bathroom. Most families would struggle with this um, other projects. Um, so that meant that we'd compromised one of the bedrooms. So to make the girls' bedrooms uh, more spacious, what we did was actually knocked out that middle, that wall that was between them, re-centred the wall and created this sort of bunk bed wall to divide it. So the two beds actually stack on top of each other to give those rooms each a bit more space. And then it was a very simple bathroom fit out and a very simple laundry fit out. So this was very much about a small house staying within its place. The second one is uh, a property in St Kilda and this one as you can see is one of a series of row of terraces, quite common in the, some of these streets at the back of St Kilda there. But uniquely it had this aspect to the south to the park. Now this park is, um, is pretty average, there's a lot of loitering that goes on. Um, and what we had noticed in going there was that most of the houses, particularly those to the right hand side there you can see, all had their backs turned to the house. So what we were trying to do, even though the client was very conservatively coming along, was suggest that if we are going to be elevated, why don't we have a sense of this is another tree sort of sitting over in the landscape, looking over the, land, the, the park area there and giving some a bit more extensive extension to his upper bedroom area. So here you can see that the plan where it's very much a, a we kept a, the front section, which is a Victorian terrace, and then had that little L-shaped space that is very much mimicking sort of the standard extensions in the area. And also with north up the page, it meant that we created a courtyard that sort of grabs the, the northern light. 
But this idea of it starting, this little curved balcony looks out to the back to the parkland, which you can see here. So this was just a really simple gesture about a screen that starts to actually pre pre the prevent overlooking of the neighbour and then lowers down and gives you a vista out to the, to the parkland. And so it's the idea of you being up in the canopy of the trees. And then here at night, the other gesture was the idea of this glowing box, which is the stairwell. So when you go up the stairwell, there's, there's a, again another window just in the middle there that you can see, so that you get these glimpses out to the park. So it's not necessarily that we've opened out to the park. Um, it was a challenge for the client to actually say that he could pull down that fence and do that. But just having moments that sort of kept observing the park and providing that passive surveillance, um, which again goes to that principle of safety. So. It was the idea of connecting to this place as a, acknowledging that the park was there, um, but also bringing in some of those principles about safety and passive surveillance. And there you can see that, that sort of idea of it glowing in the dark. And the curve was the idea of the sort of just a really simple idea about it being a sort of organic thing that sits with the trees above, um, with the timber at reflecting that as well. Um, so the third one, sorry, there's five. <laughs> the third one is pretty much a typ typical suburban subdivision, but in a coastal area. Um, it was a new subdivision, and um, like the two previous to this, and which seems to be the theme of this story today, um, it had a north-facing front, which I think most of us know that you know that's not typical. We quite like having our, our um, living spaces, etc., towards the rear, and so therefore we tend to like having them um, private and with a north-facing backyard as opposed to a south-facing backyard. But this client was very keen on this property, um, and uh, I think she'd seen some other things that we'd done with the north. So um, we took it on and set up the idea of a very simple, um, affordable sort of house model that looks at the idea of setting up a courtyard and it's just a really simple gesture. It's nothing clever about it at all, but it's the idea that you come into the front, there's the garage there with a fence to it that sets up a sense of privacy, an entry in the middle, and then the bedroom wing, which is the more private wing, is towards the rear, and then quite a large northwest facing gable, uh, sorry, northwest facing garden space. Um, I think it's really important to point out this house is about 130 square metres, which in today's context is, is not enormous, but I'll show you that um, in a minute. And then the other thing about this place is a history of, of place and the idea of boat houses. Now, there is a bit of a plethora of this going on in this town at the moment, but there is a nostalgia for these old boat houses that have been moved around the town in various places. Um, so we took that and looked at the proportions and the form, and we've done this a few times with people where they're, they're very keen on the idea of the boat house, but in this case, it would be the second time that we really paired that back to a really simple gable. Um, and there you can see the idea of just a really, the gable is the main form and then the carport and the entry are really simple sort of um, planar forms that um, house the car and the entry. And then this one, so we're going sort of from inner urban to, to rural. Um, this one is again a suburban subdivision but in a bigger bushland setting so it's sort of twice the amount of site area than, than the last one. But as you can see there it's um, very much there is a sense of subdivision. So on the street front there's definitely a sense of other houses, but towards the rear is very much this idea of bushland and native vegetation. And it's on a sloped site. So um, it was very significant. So you can see there the vegetation that was available. So, but, and yet it had all been cleared at the front for the, um, for the works and the subdivision and the work. So this subdivision was done a number of years ago and this client came to us about four years ago to look at this. So our response was to look at the idea again of, because of the suburban subdivision, setting up a sort of almost a bit of a barrier, still giving some link to the street, but setting up a bit of a public-private interface and then allowing the building to sort of almost just wrap around the landscape towards the rear. So again, a very simple gesture, um, but allowing us to get that north facing to the to the living dining areas in that pod to the right hand side. And just a simple entry that takes you in off the street or at the um, driveway garage there. So uh, it can be a little complicated to look at this plan, or at least the builders thought it was. Um, so if you look at the top plan, the idea was because of the slope site, you come in on a ramp, 
into an entry space and then there's bedroom, bathroom. Um, and I'm pointing at the screen, which is really helpful for you. <laughs> um, so the, the bedroom, bathroom there, then descend down another set of stairs into the living, dining, kitchen area with a big deck that opens up. And then upstairs again is the idea of the bathrooms there in their own pods that form a bit of a shield to the western sun, but also little pockets of veranda that are very much shielded, that shield these east-facing bedrooms. Um, and then that carport below. Um, and so then this is this front screen. So it is the idea of a sort of semi-public private. The gate opens to give a sense of gesture that you can come in, but very much that screen forms a bit of a veil um, and, um, and sets up almost a sort of private sort of idea of, of the place. But then as you go into the space, you can see that, on, particularly on the left-hand side, the living and dining really is much more about being open to the landscape. Um, and then the last site in terms of place is, uh, is a property out at Deans Marsh. So this, this property is located sort of between Deans Marsh and the back of the Otways. It's one of the last properties looking right to the back of the Otways. That site, and I haven't unfortunately got any photographs, but that site drops right down um, quite dramatically at about 22 degrees to somewhere between 22 and 26 to 30 degrees, depending on where you're standing. Um, into the valley of, and then looks back across the Otways. So this project came just at the just um, just after the um, uh, Black Saturday fires. I keep forgetting what the name is because I call it February seven. Um, uh, and so we were looking at a site that um, obviously we had a bushfire risk, but we also had a changing regulation environment around us. Then it was changing rapidly, and nobody was really understanding all of the regs around us. Um, it was also on the day that the client signed the deal, they then were handed the soil report and it said that the site was problematic and likely to slippage. So um, I immediately rang up the engineers and said, right, this is going to be one of those collaborative kind of efforts. You need to come and have a look and see what that means for me. So gone was an idea of a really solid wall and um, in response we had to look at a completely different structure that, that took the landscape in another way. Also, I should note that it's north facing to the top, and of course the views are all to the south, which is just typical. <laughs> Nothing's easy, but it works. So, um, so this was the plan. So it's still quite a linear building. So the client was very keen on a linear building that looked out to the landscape. And so pretty much every room has a view out to the, the broader landscape. You come into the house in the centre there, and it's the idea of coming into a sort of closed private space. And then as you step through the house, the views start to open up. So you then go into the living dining and the living actually projects itself out above the landscape. Because um, as I said, you enter, um, it's quite a steep fall. So if I go to the section, and that doesn't quite show up, but it's a very simple idea of the section of it falling with the site. But um, it's, uh, you start um, on ground more or less on one side and then you're about two and a half, three metres above ground on the next. That's just one room depth, that's all it is. So it's, it can be quite a dramatic fall across that site. Um, and so we also looked at the idea of, of roofs, of the idea of rural sheds. So gone away from the idea of a round earth building, which was originally where we'd started. We went to the idea of, of very much the rural sheds that were around um, using things like natural zinc loom and then the dark kind of um, colour bond to sort of recede in the landscape. I should say the zinc loom was a bit of a battle. The local authority doesn't like zinc loom. Um, but as you can see from that site photo, uh, it's a pretty remote site that I'm struggling to understand how it would have much glare impact on anyone else. So we, um, we well, I demanded that the planners actually go to the site and see it. Um, and they agreed that perhaps their, their no zinc loom policy could be overridden in this case given that there was a galvanised shed across the road. Um, so that, and again, that was very much about the sort of, the, res the looking at place, not just as a physical sense, but at a sort of social um, and a built form context as well. Um, and then it's the idea of very separated buildings so that there's one sort of singular gesture where you come into that carport and the buildings are either side of it um, and a low sort of end. And then you can see this is the element sitting up in the landscape. And, uh, very much about steel posts and a very simple structure 
that can be fire robust. Um, that's the deck joists that are exposed for any of you that know about fire regulations. Um, and, um, and what's happened here is the structure is actually, the footings of the, the structure are actually holding the ground together. So there's quite a lot of, so we've tried to minimise the number of interventions into the ground plane and just really, but then they actually tie the ground together. Um, and as I said, very simple sort of idea of um, a sort of shed in the landscape. So then when we come to people, I thought it was worth just dwelling on this for a minute, this is a whole range of people that we work with, um, that when I started, you could do a house renovation, you could get out the timber framing manual and you could pretty much say, oh yeah, there's a few sizes. You'd be told what the local soil class was and you'd lodge a building permit. Now that, I mean, that sounds a lot more straightforward than it probably was, but it was pretty simple. Today, we, um, we particularly down in the Ballerine area, we have to get a flood level from the Karangamite Shire before we can start. We have to determine our bushfire rating, so we have to get a consultant on board for that. And then through the process, of course, we have to get structural engineers, we have to get soil tests done, we have to get energy assessments, we get quantity surveyors involved, and that's just for a house. So I think my point being that architecture is a very collaborative um, uh, pursuit um, and profession um, and certainly you know you, you know we often talk about the masters of architecture but that sort of has changed to a degree and then obviously there's a collaboration in the office and the design work that goes on there but the thing that we really enjoy generally as a practice is is the collaboration with the tradespeople and the builders on site and um, and you know just making decisions and being aware of decisions when you're on site of, of the implications or what that actually means is really important so for instance that bottom right hand corner you know i just drew a solid cement sheet of 2400 high by 1200 wide and was like that's fine and of course it took three of them to lift it into position so you know you learn little things like that on site while you're there so i think it's just understanding that it is collaborative um, and that everybody contributes. It's not just about the people as a client, but, um, but there are lots of other people involved in the process. But I just thought I'd take you through that idea of people and how they actually can inform a brief. So going to this project in Parkville again, um, here it was things like the client is from an Italian background um, and she is a huge cook. She is a massive cook and it's a very interactive process for them. So part of that opening up wasn't just about light and connection to the garden, which was part of their values, but it was also about how do we create a kitchen that very much engages with the dining room, that it's no longer separated. So you can see there, we're dealing with a house that very much that kitchen was a separate space to the dining space. So, and it, it seems really obvious, but so we opened up the um, kitchen to the dining and created it more like a country kitchen. So rather than having the island bench as something that runs along between the dining space and the kitchen. It was very much about this island bench sort of floating in the middle, almost like the old country table. Um, so it was just a simple thing like that that sort of helps them interact. And then um, it has evolved since then. But um, And then the idea that the kids can sort of be interactive with that process. So here you can see it sort of in its iteration of that idea of that central island bench where everybody works that very much is sort of gesturing itself out to the dining room rather than forming a barrier to the dining room. So people can move and mingle around and then very robust stainless steel benches running around the edges, chalkboards, all very practical so that it's about cooking and life in the kitchen it's, and it's not about closing it all off and making it private. And they also came to us saying, you know, we want something a bit punky which is kind of interesting for me because I never went through a punk phase. But, but you know, it, was, it wasn't that they wanted something slick and they were very, we don't want something entered in the design awards. Um, so it was that fine. Um, and then the other element of this too was just insertions that provided lots of storage um, to meet sort of their different needs. And a really interesting house in terms of there is no focus on a television. So they're not television people, they're very much music people. Um, and the other part of the people of this house were these two young girls. So again, I explained to you earlier about that idea of them um, sharing a room. So in this case, um, we, just, we came up with this idea of the fact that they'd shared a room but they were obviously going to need their autonomy at some point in the, in the future. So we came, and then the space saver. So we came up with the idea of this bunk bed wall. And what it is, is you can see here that there's the idea of the two beds are stacked on top of each other and they can see through each other. They've got little nooks at the end of their beds that they keep their treasures. Um, and then on the left-hand side of the robes, back to back. But then 
as their mood passes or as they grow older, they can start to close the space off and define their own bedroom in their own way. So it's just a simple little gesture of sliding panels, but it's just the idea of giving them that sense of shared space that they both value with each other, but also the, their sense of identity for themselves. And then this one I just thought I'd touch on is St Kilda. This was this client, and I'm not sure if you can make it all out, but this client is a collector. Um, <laughs> I can't quite define what he collects apart from Versace. Um, <laughs> but um, there was a lot of stuff. And so we were creating lots of nooks and places for things to go. So, you know, up on an overhead shelf unit, we had more space. And then the idea of having a shelf unit sort of housed into the thickness of the wall so that it could become a display device that not only displays to the kitchen side for sculptures but also displays to the courtyard and then you can see some more display in the older space beyond while we were trying to sort of be really pared back and minimalist which is kind of fun um, and then this house is interesting because it was for a single mother with two young boys so it needed to be affordable it needed to be compact but it needed to have some sense of space and, and the right number of rooms that to accommodate it. When she came to us, she was looking at doing a prefabricated house. Now, first of all, it didn't fit on the site, which was kind of weird that they presented it to her that way. Um, but um, then the other was that it presented very much a, just a linear um, kitchen, dining, living, just an all one space and flat ceilings. And I could see a nightmare about to occur with two young boys kind of coming into 12 and 14 um, and a mother on her own who might be having friends over, what have you. But certainly the affordability wasn't that they were going to be able to afford to build another living space. So what we did here was the idea of setting up um, a very simple space, as I said, a very simple form, um, as I said, quite small, it's about 130 square metres. But what we've done is separated the dining, uh, the kitchen dining away from the living space and created a little deck between with glazing either side, which also works to actually provide north facing glass into the living room. Um, and here you can see that sort of idea. So the kids often are in here on playstations or televisions or whatever and you can see straight through to the dining room space through the pair of doors and then of course there's the glass link. So they're just small gestures but there were things about the people and the response to them. Um, and the other thing was about the fact that they're quite keen beach users. So that idea of using this space is that you come in through the driveway, I don't know if you can understand that cupboard there with the surfboards in it. But it's, the, it's this whole idea of how do these people experience their lives and their lives are about bikes and surfing. So they come into the garage, they drop all of their surf gear off, they've got an outdoor shower and then they can go through the back door into the laundry space and then come back around to the bathrooms. The other thing is the bathrooms are really compact in this space. Um, the ensuite is probably the most generous of them. Um, they were talked into a walk-in laundry, I think she doesn't regret that. Um, and so, and then, yes, so it's very much about this lifestyle of West facing, which is something she was very keen on. It's probably something I wouldn't do myself, but she was really keen on the idea of getting West facing. So we set up this courtyard space, or this courtyard deck, with um, um, the potential for a pergola and um, uh, plants to grow across it. And the other thing I should say too is that idea of that big central courtyard is really lots of running around space for the boys. Um, Um, yeah, that's good, yeah. And and with the clients at Aries Inlet, they came to us. They live in a small house in a um, small terrace in Flemington. They were very much wanting more space. They were very conscious of storage, and their big desire was timber. Um, uh, he works in the timber industry, and um, she's been she's done the odd woodworking class, etc. So timber was a big theme. So we we brought not only was the house timber on the outside, this is the one with all of the cladding to the outside, but it's also um, plywood lined to all of the public spaces, lots and lots of joinery, lots of shelves, books, etc. Um, and his big request was his only request, in fact, was uh, that he needed a display for his absinthe dispenser which I have to say is a lot smaller than I'd anticipated. Um, and so it sits in one of those tall windows there in the living dining space and is framed by the tree view behind. So just creating little things like that. And then again, she was really adamant about storage and providing anywhere that, anywhere that we could provide storage, we went for it. So these stairs, for instance, have little sliding panels and there's a tiny bit of storage where quirky little games are kept or plastic fingers hanging out with a bit of blood on them, just for the amusement. 
And this client was very much um, one of a couple and he. this is very much a holiday house. So just the small thing that we did here was set up the house so that they could in fact have all of that massive entertainment area, which they're very much into. But then on the left hand side there is their bedroom suite, which can actually be shut off and, and locked away while they rent it out. Um, and then their family, to the, which, who occupy the right hand side of the house, comprise of parents, siblings and the siblings' children. So we have enough accommodation for all of them, as long as the siblings will sleep in the bunk bed. So I don't know if you can make out. So you come in through here and there's that idea of mudroom and toilet in this front hallway. Um, and then um, go off down here. And there's a, a nook there that's for bunk beds. And the little kid, the little um, nieces and nephews very much enjoy that. Uh, they feel like they're on a railway carriage. Um, and then just that idea, the final idea about leadership and governance. And um, it, it isn't literally leadership and governance, though we do participate in some things that I guess are associated with that. But when we talk about leadership and government in this context, I guess it's that idea of responsibility for the future, responsibility of the legacies that we inherit, um, being innovative um, and... Um, yeah, the future in terms of climate change and sustainability and things. So I just thought this was an interesting series of images just to show you there's a couple of, a, a few projects there we're working on and that idea of sustainability on the left. But um, we've had the extraordinary privilege of working on a massive homestead in, um, towards the Western District and um, it's, it's extraordinary the number of cottages and houses and things there. And, and it's been a really interesting dialogue with the client about the legacy of which of what he's inherited and understanding that he may feel that certain people are telling him what to do but if he's going to do it properly he needs to do it if he's going to do it he needs to do it well and then we've had the benefit of working on quite substantial mansions etc so if I bring it back to those um, those five houses that I talked about um, the first one um, there's just small things like with this, they were very conscious of ageing. So, and that's something that is starting, you know, thinking about the future, thinking about our ageing population um, and our families in the future. So, they were conscious that with the configuration that we'd come up with, that we obviously had all of the wet areas upstairs, what happens when we have a third generation who really is just going to struggle to get up the stairs these days? So, we came up with the idea of the outback dunny, or what we call the folly. Um, and the folly is, um, is literally, this, is, this glowing box here is a toilet and shower to outside. So you sit outside the dunny and you can just see a bit of the, on the left hand side, um, just here is this little panel that opens. So you sit on the toilet back here and you can actually look down the garden like you do in the old fashioned bush toilets. But it was just the idea of something that is simply inserted and allows them some more flexibility for the future should an older parent be there. And here we have this idea of a little bit of surprise that you open it up. It's using the existing wall that was there, um, which is that brick wall there, and then we've just appended this to the side. So it's a kind of glow-in-the-dark toilet and shower. So it's a bit of fun and folly, as we called it. And then another small gesture of um, thinking about the future, uh, I just turned to them and said, look, you know, you've got one bathroom, two daughters, two parents, I think what we might do is look at the laundry being a sort of second quasi basin. So apparently dad shaves here. Um, and we, we and so what we said was let's put a mirror in there. So the girls can come and do their makeup when they're older or um, be doing their hair or whatever. Um, maybe they'll be shaving. Um, hopefully not. Um, but certainly it just it's just a small thing, but it just provides a bit more flexibility to a house. And, and that's certainly a lot of things that we look at. We have much smaller houses typically, so we try to look at that idea of flexibility as much as possible. And then, of course, the other is just in this house, particularly the point of sustainability. This didn't achieve a major star rating in terms of energy consumption. You know, it was an existing double brick house. It was a struggle. Its north facing wall, its north facing was a solid wall, boundary wall to the, the neighbour. But I think what's um, inherent here is that they've actually seen a legacy and we've seen a legacy and we've held on to that legacy. Um, as something that's um, quite valuable um, to us as a community and a society. But also by holding on and just making those small insertions and retaining that quality of swellagant with the uplighting, deep uplighting cornices, is that, you know, here's a major, here's quite a substantial structure that we haven't put in landfill. And the reality is that the commitment to this sort of project could have been far less had they just said, let's demolish it and let's start again, and they could have ended up at the same price. But 
you know, things like thinking about that and saying, look, there were good bones in the house. It had a lot of work to be done, but there were good bones. So I think their sort of demonstration of leadership um, and doing the best, doing better for the community. And I should add that then, of course, the front yard is a vegetable garden. There's nothing um, pretty about that. And then talking to another heritage house is that idea of retaining heritage, but being respectful of the heritage. So here you can see that double-fronted Victorian terrace that we were working with, and that idea of that um, uh, extension to the back is very much separated. And that's where the courtyard also became another device. So not only was it a device to help us get the northern sunlight in, but it was also a device to help us be very clear about what's the original house and what's the new, and retain the integrity of the old house. So you can see here, coming into the workings of the house, you actually come in through the terrace Sorry, through the terrace front doors. There's a couple of bedrooms now placed here, a bit of a formal dining and wet area. And then we open out to the kitchen and dining living space with that courtyard space. And that courtyard has proven to be a very good device in order to separate the old from the new and give quite a clear distinction, particularly as there's a, lane, a, a pedestrian laneway running down the back there. And then when you come up the stairs, you can see that idea of that little deck that folds around from the bedroom and the stair that wraps around. Um, and glows out to the street, uh, the park, sorry. And that's that courtyard there. And the other aspect to this is just things that we talked about in government about maintenance and durability. And dry and as boring as they are, they're incredibly important to government, but they become very important to clients. So the top level here is just simple colour bond. It will stay there for 20 years. It might need a hose down occasionally, but it doesn't need to be painted or maintained over a regular time. And then downstairs is just easily painted if they need to do that. Um, and then this house is, uh, is probably more about affordability and our looking at, at that idea of projecting um, what will happen for them in terms of the children growing older and using those spaces. But a model that we see is really important for us in terms of we're trying to develop more affordable house models, um, not so much as cheap as the volume builds, but something that gives a bit of quality at a much cheaper price point than usually an architect provides. I think the other important thing about this house is it's a small footprint relatively. Most of the houses in this area are now filling that courtyard. So they're probably in the order of 250, 300 square metres of floor area, but still housing the same number of people in them. So that's something that we work on. That, that we make the spaces as efficient as possible. They're not overly generous, they're not overly tight, but they're just a sort of good economical model that means that it's more about landscape um, uh, and it's more about indoor-outdoor living than it is about this internalised sense of living. Um, and the other thing I should talk about there is also this gesture that we have at the moment, which is this idea of the kitchen window out to the public. So I guess it's from a sort of nostalgic idea of, you know, Mrs So-and-so looking out the street and watching everybody's business. But it's also one of those things about passive surveillance, that there is a sense of... The pub, your public um, experience inside is actually watching out over, over the street as well. Um, and certainly through the Government Architect we talked about that idea of passive surveillance in a lot of other building typologies. But there's lots of crime statistics, and I get on my high horse about it, there are lots of crime statistics about having high fences, that once you have a high fence you're more likely to be robbed. And that's simply because they can't see in. So once the person's in, they're in. Your neighbours can't see in. So. Things like a gesture of that, that public window looking out over the street is something that we support. And, um, uh, and then the idea too here of using sustainable timbers that will just weather over time and blend into the landscape. Um, and very much about that window looking out. And then talking about timbers, there's things like this house for instance, which was, um, there's a few things here that, that talk about the future and, and sort of trying to lead by example. The ramp there is about trying to give an ease of access for ageing and people who might find it a bit more difficult as they get older or they might have an injury just breaking an ankle. Um, and then the timbers, for instance, we use, uh, we try and re resource them from an area that's only a couple of hours away, that's um, grown as um, cops of trees by farmers. We're now struggling to get it. I think I used all of it um, on this house. Um, uh, but um, very much that idea of um, a timber house that's bushfire resistant. So we also took on board that this had a relatively low bushfire resistance, but we increased it um, because I was concerned that it didn't actually have the correct rating, but um, also that the threat was probably more, was a bit of a, well, realistically was a higher one. 
Um, things like those silver panels that wrap around, or the aluminium panels that wrap around the windows are set up there for future, the idea of um, roller shutters being able to integrate to protect those windows should they wish to take that a further step in terms of their fire rating. Um, and then of course the other way you can get into this house is you come in down the carport and you access through a single level going into the living space downstairs. Um, and then also, again, just being economical and, and using every space that we possibly could. So with that split level, we actually found that we could push the, the lower level in a bit further. So push this level in a bit further here. So we have a day bed here, but then in behind here, we have a bit more space. And what we've created is yet another bed. So this house now sleeps 14 people. Two, four, six, sorry, that's a lie. 10 people. Um, and it's 150 square metres. Um, so, and then again, more of the timber, more storage, more storage, more storage. But so you can see there, just that simple day bed there. And then these sliding panels here, these pan plywood panels just slide right back and then a mattress rolls out and you can sleep about four people on that space. It's kind of weird, it's a bit like camping in a really low tent, but um, it's, um, it's uh, quite a fun experience. We used to joke about various families living in there. Um, I'm really coming to the end of the talk there, so I think I can't recall why I thought this was um, so... Oh, despite the fact that it was south-facing, and of course all of you was to the south-facing, how do you get this to be um, energy, um, perform well in a sort of energy sense? So it's small things, like we punched a whole lot of windows, even though we've got that, pri that sense of privacy from the rear, we punched a whole lot of windows at the high level and then scooped up some of the roof space there just to um, get that north facing sun in. And we managed to get, at the time, um, I think seven stars, which is pretty onerous when you've got a building that's elevated out of the ground and isn't with concrete slab. Um, and then obviously that idea that I said before about the use of the house, that there's the flexibility that it can in fact become a rented out holiday accommodation place as well as just their own space. Zones set up so that when they do come they very much can just be in that space to the left hand side and once the wood heat is going the rest of the house can stay cold. Uh, and again um, really well and truly rated so that um, for bushfire it's as robust as possible but we have told them just leave, um, they're in quite a vulnerable area. And here you can see that idea of the north facing windows on the left hand side here, these little glimpses up into the trees and the treetops there. Um, and the way the ceiling folds up to them. But then they sort of big gesture views. So it was balancing those sort of views out to the south and the extent of heat loss we were gonna get um, with gaining that sun on the north side. And there it is elevated out of the landscape again, um, hopefully being as polite as possible even though it's, it seems quite big. Um, so thank you for today. I think, I guess what I thought in summary of all of this was that it was trying to demonstrate, again going back to what I said about the Office of the Victorian Government Architect, good design isn't necessarily a gesture, it isn't necessarily an aesthetic or a hero shot. Good design is actually, if it, if it doesn't work, it's not good design. So it's, it's all of those qualities that we embed about safety, sustainability, um, about good positive spaces, um, being economic, etc. And one of the big things that we used to say was that good design doesn't necessarily cost, but it takes time. And I think that's something that we often forget in the rush of all of our work, but it is a really important thing. So it's really just remembering that good design isn't necessarily some flamboyant sort of gesture. It's actually, it has some core principles to it. So thank you for having me. I hope I haven't bored you. <laughs>